Welcome to Pod Save America. I'm John Favreau. I'm John Lovett. I'm Tommy Vitor. Which what? was so funny. You said a different inflection. I liked it. It's an evening. <laughs> it's my. It's how I sound in the evening. Yeah, Welcome to our. Different. It's an evening recording, though. You're getting this first thing Tuesday morning, hopefully. Recording I mean, hopefully this. you're listening right away. Monday night. Monday it's, night. It's Pod Save America Raw. Oh, this is nice. Just me and my, my island boys. <laughs> you guys up on your TikTok trends now? Okay, never mind. No, Keep I am not. Keep I'm going. Not. On today's pod. Facebook employees say Facebook is dangerous. A Rolling Stone report suggests that the January 6th insurrection was an inside job. You might say Facebook had a no bones day. Okay. (laughs) That's a TikTok trend. That one's actually very funny. And Andrew Yang stopped by Crooked HQ to chat with Lovett about his new party, sorry, about his new third party, Forward. Speaking of a violent insurrection, how'd that conversation go? (laughs) It was good. I asked him some hard questions. Mm-hmm. We had a good conversation. I, uh, you know. When I saw him in the it, lobby, I said, love is going to gut you like a fish, and he didn't really laugh. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't laugh, and it was like, I was, I did go pretty hard at him about, I, you should listen to the conversation, because what I said to him is like, all right, you have goals for ranked choice voting. We think that's great, but we don't want you to do anything that makes uh, electing Donald Trump uh, an easier thing to do. Yeah. So, yeah. And he said yes. He, I, I don't, look, who knows what the well, future I'll holds. listen to the interview. Listen to the interview. I'll listen. You, you all listen to the interview, too. Let's get to the news. All right. <laughs> Uh, if you woke up to a shitload of stories about Facebook this week, it's because whistleblower Francis Haugen went beyond the Wall Street Journal to provide a consortium of more than a dozen news organizations, thousands of pages of internal conversations and research. I like that the uh, they created a Slack thread for all the journalists, and even they were uncomfortable with the idea of being a consortium, and so they yeah. said, I guess we're a consortium now. <laughs> yeah. Uh, these are documents that also form the basis of a series of disclosures she filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission, the testimony she gave Congress, and the testimony she delivered on Monday to the UK's parliament. The headline from all of this, unsurprisingly, is that Facebook is bad. It's bad. Uh, The company's own research says that, and plenty of the company's own employees say it on internal message boards all the time, apparently. (laughs) Beyond that, it can be tough to follow the details of all these stories, but the gist is that the algorithms designed by Facebook push people towards more radicalizing and polarizing content, that the problem is even worse in other countries, that Mark Zuckerberg both lies and lives in fear of being accused of liberal bias, and that the company didn't do nearly enough to stop the January 6th insurrection that was largely organized on its platform. I want to dive into all the specifics, but what do you guys think about how this information was released? Did you find it difficult to process all these stories, Tommy? Uh, yes. So I credit first. I was initially quite impressed with the rollout. That series of Wall Street Journal stories uh, were they're thorough. They were spaced out well. They were devastating. And then the really brilliant move was convincing 60 Minutes to do a big exclusive where the only carrot they really had dangled in front of them was naming the whistleblower who then repeated all the stuff from the Wall Street Journal stories. And they got a second bite of the apple. Today was too much, man. <laughs> my, my understanding is that there were 68 stories. The consortium got out of control. <laughs> 68 stories posted today, all embargoed for like 7 a.m. Eastern or, or whatever, on like eight different topics. I was just awash with Facebook news. I could not follow all of it. Yes, and I do think that a fair amount of it was overlapping both with Wall Street Journal reporting from the past couple of weeks and from other stories that came out today. It didn't feel like there was like the same division of labor that happened with some other kind of consortiums like what what uh, what was formed around uh, Snowden's leaks and some of the other right. ones we've seen yes. in the past. Yeah, maybe this is just like the political staffer in me talking, but no one has been driving a message about Facebook here right. that based on these documents. And so it definitely served the needs of and, and, the, and the way that many journalists want to do their jobs, which is great. And I'm, I'm glad that good for them, for so many of them, for writing fantastic stories. And they, they did a great job. But if the goal of, the, of, of Francis Haugen is to like deliver a single message or even a couple big messages about Facebook, I, I, I worry, I mean, we're going to try to do that here in this segment, but I do worry that um, it's going to be hard for your average reader to understand exactly what was going on there and what she was trying to say. Yeah, and I also think that there is enough in what we learned today that had it been spaced out over the next couple of days or weeks, it might have had a more lasting impact. We'll see. There's a very funny uh, uh, graph in Ben Smith's story about the sort of like media piece of it all and how it all came together, where the various journalists in this um, Slack room whatever what the fuck do you call a slack thing 
Slack channel. Slack group. Slack were channel. arguing over what to call it, and they didn't want to call it the Facebook Files because that was the Wall Street Journal branding. So the Times started fighting with that, and then Casey Newton, who's a very funny, very smart tech reporter, uh, said they should call it the Leftovers. I that was <laughs> and I was funny. like, that is awesome <laughs> and self-aware and very funny. That was really funny. However, I will say, if you don't want the Wall Street Journal to have a cool name all to themselves. Everyone should have just called it the Facebook files. Right. It would have yeah. taken the branding away from the Wall Street this Journal. This is the not the Again, most important piece just, of this. Just some some political. Uh... Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and I also love, too, that, of course, the New York Times, which lives to uh, pretend as though there are no other journalists so in the world, are like, we're going to go with our story first because some of it was based on reporting we had gathered. Oh, previously. they broke the embargo. Yeah. yeah. No, but no, Mike, Mike Isaac was the one arguing us using that branding. And he's like super fun. He wrote Super Pumped, that great Uber book that yeah, everyone loved. Fantastic. Anyway, but. Uh, I love the little I love the little chippy back and forth among journalists. Like that, no way that's going to work without them fighting. Before we I get loved into, it. before we get into some of the details, any other big takeaways, overall broad takeaways that you guys uh, got from these stories? I think two, um, I, which is actually it's just complementary to what we already learned from the Washington from the Wall Street Journal. One, to a shocking degree, Facebook has basically total clarity into the problems that they're causing, uh, and and two just how much internal debate and strife there is within Facebook, acknowledging how bad it is in real time and desperate for the company to do more. Though um, <laughs> we were talking about this before we recorded, but there is a little bit of like, there's a lot of complaining from people about what Facebook isn't doing and, and they all work at Facebook and there's a little bit of like, if these guys don't clean up their acts before my stock vests, I swear to God, I'm out of here. <laughs> Tommy? Uh, Three takeaways. One, as bad as we think Facebook is here in the U.S., it's exponentially worse abroad, and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that more later. Two, there's just like <laughs> there's so many instances of Mark Zuckerberg uh, specifically prioritizing financial considerations over safety and the quality of discourse and the quality of the product. Too, it's just like rarely do you have someone so nailed dead to rights on that. And then just three, and I think this is sort of the core of what we'll talk about for most of the conversation today is that politics in the fear of being called biased drives so much of what they do. And I think it's important to remember a little history here because I remember this happening in real time because I was living in San Francisco at the time. In 2016, Gizmodo wrote a story quoting a former Facebook staffer that alleged that the trending topics page was biased against conservative outlets and stories. And that supercharged this like coordinated effort by Republicans and like uh, people on the Hill to say that Facebook was biased. And it was incredibly successful. And I remember when Zuckerberg invited Glenn Beck and a bunch of conservatives to Menlo Park, right? That meeting, like you could tell Zuckerberg thought it worked because Glenn Beck walked out of it and said a bunch of really nice things about Facebook. He said that they were behaving appropriately, that they were humble, open, and they listened. And so Mark kept doing these dinners with Trump, Tucker Carlson, Brent Bozell, Ben Shapiro, and, and, <clears throat> sorry, and then like Joel Kaplan, this prominent Republican, rose to power. And so the result is all these political considerations that make no sense uh, when you when you really dig into them, like Breitbart being called news, Politico, The Washington Post, Axios, Reuters being called liberal. It's a organization that is scared to death of being called politically biased and, and they're willing to have a platform that is full of misinformation and incitement and outright garbage if, if they're not called liberals. I think that tech executives are the easiest mark Totally. For pun um, intended, John. <laughs> there you go. Thank I you. think they are the I think they are <laughs> the easiest mark for ref working because they all believe that technology is beyond politics and that Democrats and Republicans aren't always right and we can solve our political problems through technology. And so when you accuse them of being biased towards one side or the other, they take it very seriously. Also, it's who Mark brought in, right? Sheryl Sandberg, you know, was he brought in a bunch of like Republicans or at best centrist Democrats to help run uh, run Facebook and, and on, at least on the political side. Well, what I I think you're right. I think it's not just that they think what they're doing is out is outside of politics. It's that it's more important than politics and politics in the sweep of history is a distraction from the great work they're doing to build this kind of utopia. The other piece of it, so I think you're right, they're fr ter terrified of being called con uh, being called liberal, especially because a lot of their, um, they, they view their staff as being liberal. Right, um, yes. But the other piece of this, and, and I- And they may have liberal, social, and cultural values. Yeah, they're cosmopolitan conservatives, a lot of these people is what they are. They are, they are pro-gay in some ways. They are uh, um, uh, pro-equality, but when push comes to shove, they have conservative leanings. But 
when I talked to Shira, Shira Frankel, uh, who wrote that book about, uh, about Facebook, um, my question to her was when Mark gave up on this idea of a libertarian paradise, which is where he was not that long ago. Like when he talked to Kara Swisher, he was like, I think Holocaust denial is okay because people should see it. Mm-hmm. And, and I asked them, like, what replaces the larger ethic about how Facebook governs speech if it's not going to be libertarian anymore? And she couldn't say. And in, uh, in, in one of the pieces, I, I, I thought this was important, right? This is what a, a Facebook team member said. They said, in multiple cases, the final judgment about whether a prominent post violates a certain written policy are made by senior executives, sometimes Mark Zuckerberg. If our decisions are intended to be an application of a written policy, then it is unclear why executives would be consulted. And so what happens is, I think, fear of being called, cons- of li- f- let me say again, what happens is there's a fear of being called liberal. There's no organizing value or principle. And so then everything becomes ad hoc everything becomes a debate, everything becomes about appearances, and you end up with a situation where (laughs) white-listed propagandists are allowed to spread information, sectarian strife spreads in India and around the world, and there's no governing principle to prevent it. I will say, you know, Lovett, you said a couple minutes ago that uh, the stories prove that Facebook really does know exactly what the problems are. I thought that they also proved that Facebook knows how to solve them or at least make them better you know one of their defenses that you hear all the time from facebook is we're working hard to solve all these problems but we'll never be able to solve uh, solve all of them because these are problems that have to do with human nature and we're just a neutral platform and and we can't restrict free speech so these are the same problems that you see in humanity anyway and we're just facebook but that's clearly not what's going on here facebook has plenty of tools to fight extremism and we know that because they have used some of them on certain occasions but they refuse to use them all the time or more um so i I thought some of the most damning revelations were about to that point facebook's algorithms pushing people towards extremism nbc ran a story about how the company created a fictitious user named carol smith who described herself as politically uh, who described herself as a politically conservative mom from north carolina within two days Facebook was recommending that she join QAnon groups. Here's the weirdest part: she was arrested at the Capitol. I was, I was about to say she's actually the uh, she's, she's she's on the short list for Trump's Veep in 2024. Oh, nice. Congrats, Carol. Carol. Yeah, Carol's yours gonna, was better. Carol's going to be on the short list. Yours, yours was better. Yours is funny. What was yours that movie, works Carol? Better. What? what was that movie Carol about? Uh, a, a lesbian kind of a lesbian story involving Kate no, Blanchett. They didn't attack the Capitol. I don't think so. I don't remember it then. Um. What did you guys think of that story? A Facebook spokesperson said, it's the perfect example of research that helped inform their decision to remove QAnon from its platform. Oh, thanks. Yeah, well, that's the- it's, Which is so typical of so many of their responses. They're just, well, one, one. I really appreciated that in some internal conversation, someone at face, Facebook said, I'm sick of Mark answering a question that wasn't asked, which is what they do over and over and over again. They were so slow on QAnon. And I was thinking about how they call them, they like move fast and break things. They are now a government bureaucracy. They move incredibly slowly, incredibly <laughs> uh, uh, fecklessly around these problems because- yeah, I mean, by the time they removed QAnon, it had festered into this giant conspiracy theory, maybe one of the biggest ever. It has rendered families. Like, yeah, we talk about it in political terms. I know people in my life who have had to have divorces, and now they are co-parenting with QAnon people. It is a fucking nightmare, and they <laughs> allowed it to fester for so long. Yeah, and, and, and same with anti-vax content. I mean, this is why the, this the problem with Facebook is not about freedom of speech because it's not about your right to say you like QAnon or your right to say, I don't want to get vaccinated. The issue is that Facebook's algorithm is recommending mm-hmm. radical content to people who otherwise wouldn't have seen it. That's Why? a problem. That That is core to the the, the DNA of the product. Just going to radicalizing people. Why recommend anyone join any political group at all? Let people search for their own political groups. If they're interested in, in people with like-minded, like, go search for the political group. Don't Because they're like, oh, well, this is how we got rid of QAnon. Okay, but I'm, I'm betting that the algorithm is going to continue to push people to join more <laughs> extremist groups, other extremist groups that may not be QAnon, and then you're back to playing whack-a-mole all the time. Just there's a more fundamental design flaw here, here, which is that Facebook continues to that the algorithm continues to push people towards polarizing, radicalizing content or to join groups there, like that. Yeah, there's this um, 
Uh, Daniel Dennett is a philosopher, and he talks about something called an intuition pump. And what an intuition pump is when you use an analogy in a way that hides the truth, that makes the truth less obvious. And I think all the time Facebook tries to use these intuition pumps, which is in some ways what they want us to think about Facebook is like kind of an inert bulletin board for society, right? It's no different than a cho- than a, than a cork board hanging in a coffee shop somewhere where people put things up and other people see them, right? But it's, of course become this sophisticated operation for delivering information to people and and is and it's an incredibly sophisticated machine and an intelligent machine with agency for delivering information to people and the one thing we learned from this is right before the election they figured out how they can just literally or right after the election I'm sorry how they can literally adjust the dial and all of a sudden far less misinformation and negative content are being spread and far more accurate and reliable information is being shared and the reason is nefarious because the longer they keep you on the site the more money they make and so you have people searching for like wellness or essential oils and all of a sudden they're pulled into like pandemic and anti-vaccine content and all this right-wing sort of QAnon or QAnon adjacent content it's a problem you see happening across the spectrum and it is a problem of reach um you know jeff horowitz of the wall street journal who love it you talked to and wrote the initial round of stories i talked to that guy tommy talked oh to i'm him. sorry well, i was i was hanging out with, you guys both talked to so I was, many facebook people now i forget i was with the headband guy before it was the thing that's right you yep. were i'm sorry anyway so jeff was tweeting the other day that researchers <clears throat> including Do you Facebook- my leftovers chuck todd <laughs> you know that's wow. what i'm saying oh, okay uh researchers how's that for a consortium <laughs> sorry <laughs> Uh, researchers, you got your consortium right here, <laughs> Chuck Todd, <laughs> person Tommy's addressing this at. <laughs> what were you saying, John? Minding his own business, living his life. <laughs> you guys good? Probably. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> uh, so Jeff was tweeting the other day that researchers, including Facebook researchers, their own researchers, have noted that Facebook can reduce the spread of misinformation, hate speech, radicalizing content by restricting the reshare button and reducing the spread of viral content. There's a VP of Facebook who's the 10th longest serving employee in the company said that they could reduce most public integrity problems just by moderately reducing virality. Like that is what we're talking about here. It is the reach of, it is the sharing, it is the reach of the information, it's where it's getting spread that is causing most of the problems here. And the reason that Mark will not dial back on that is because that is where you get the engagement from. And it, um, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> drug dealers rely on repeat customers. Uh, Adrian LaFrance wrote, a, I think, a really good piece that I looks, think one of the best pieces I, of all I, the ones today, for sure. Yeah, in the Atlantic, in the Atlantic that kind of runs through, I think, the kind of overarching issues, talks a lot about what people are saying internally. And the point she makes at the end of the piece is Facebook knows that people who are isolated, recently widowed or divorced, say, or geographically distanced from loved ones are disproportionately at risk of being exposed to harmful content on the platform. It knows that repeat offenders are disproportionately responsible for spreading information. <laughs> and it knows that 3% of Facebook's users in the United States are super consumers of conspiracy theories, accounting for 37% of known consumption of misinformation on the platform. And I know there's been this analogy about the tobacco companies, but it really reminds me of that. You see domestically Facebook desperately trying to keep a hold of the kind of (laughs) the aging population that is addicted to its product, especially the kind of chain smokers of Facebook while looking for market share in the rest of the world because they know that we are starting to come down on them for the harm they are doing to people and we are trying to keep our kids off of their fucking platform and they don't know what to do. Tommy, I know you guys have covered this on Pod Save the World, but yeah, why do Facebook's problems seem even worse in other countries? The New York Times big story from the latest uh, tranche of documents was all about India, which is the company's largest market. John, th- thanks for the nod to the more intellectual offering that uh, Crooked Media has for for listeners out there. So the most Shout important, out ben <laughs> the most important stat I saw, <laughs> the most important stat I saw was that um, only 13 percent of Facebook misinformation moderation staff hours are devoted to non-U.S. countries, but 90 percent of Facebook users are outside of the United States. So what that tells you is they don't give a fuck about you if you live outside the United States. Again, not a problem you can't solve. You're just not spending as much resources outside the United States is you're spending here and it's better here well, even though it still sucks here I, I mean Facebook. I do think there's a question of like at what point do they reach a scale where they actually can't have a handle on these things because India alone 300 million Facebook users 400 million people on WhatsApp 
Um, you have 22 languages spoken in a country and then systems that can't monitor all of them. Uh, you, you don't have like either real people doing content moderation. Your AI isn't working. And so like, again, if you can't handle it, if you can't have all those people doing it, then you shut it down. It, exactly. It's on them. It's on them. Well, you can't it's build on it. governments to regulate. Right. Well, right. it's well, sort of well, like yeah. so that's asking a lot for some of these governments that are in like, you know, <laughs> well, only in the digital only in digital space. Are you allowed to build something? too big to be safe right you're not allowed to build up you're not allowed to say like look my hospital treats a lot of people unfortunately it is too big and several of the wings will fall down on you but that's the price of having a hospital this big you're not allowed to do that if you have a department store you're not allowed to have some poisonous stuff inside of your supermarket because there's just too much food coming in but only in digital space still do we allow that but also like there's also a piece of this just sort of lack of cultural understanding so in a place like burma where facebook was has been there's lots of research on how it was used to spread hate speech that led to you know a genocide against the Rohingya. Um, a lot of people in Burma didn't have internet access until they got Facebook, and then Facebook was basically their only access to the internet. So your digital literacy is obviously going to be pretty fresh. So if you see something on someone's Facebook page that says something like horribly violent or incitement or you know this Muslim group raped this person, people are more inclined to believe it because they just don't have that kind of bullshit antibody built up that we all have living in the U.S. But it sounds like Menlo Park has zero interest in understanding that context. Well, we talked about uh, Carol's journey, right? Carol, the Christian conservative from North Carolina. Mm -hmm. They created an account in India that wasn't that didn't even identify as a certain political persuasion, just a random fake, a random fake account. And within just a couple weeks, that account was inundated with hate speech, misinformation, and celebrations of violence. Uh, the user who was running the account said they saw more dead bodies uh, yeah. uh, in in that couple weeks than they had in their entire life. And, and again, no one is blaming Facebook or saying that Facebook is the reason there are tensions between Hindus and Muslims in India. That that predates Facebook. But it is certainly the case that when there's sectarian tension. Facebook can be a dangerously powerful it's the tool fuel on the to fire. spread it. It's yes. well, the fuel on the fire. It is. Fire. Well, like, so often I think Facebook's, I think, core defense is something along the lines of, we are the new public square for humanity. Humanity is flawed. Those flaws manifest on Facebook. We are not responsible for that. We are a place where everyone can gather. But well, that is... Yeah, yeah, but I mean, that's what I was just saying. You, all the people and the, all the Facebook employees themselves and all these message boards are being like, we are not neutral. This platform is not neutral. Well, not only is it not neutral, the fact that you are well aware that people come to your platform as um, they're not uh, macroeconomic nodes, but actual human beings with flaws and biases should lead you to be cautious in right. the tools you give them to spread misinformation and hate on the internet. It's not an excuse for letting people be terrible to each other in a way that leads to violence. It's a responsibility you have. But again, it's not just the tools that they're giving them. It, The company itself and the algorithms themselves are actually pushing of people course. towards more radicalizing content. And, and knowingly so. I mean, it, like the, the, this guy, Boz, who's now the chief technology officer, who's the deputy who's been there forever, he wrote this memo that he's kind of walked away from or just said was you know, sort of performative or, or meant to sort of create a conversation. But he literally wrote, Maybe it costs a life by exposing someone to bullies. Maybe someone dies in a terrorist attack coordinated on our tools and we still connect people. They are like, it, it's a religious focus on connection and it's all like sort of embedded in this like naive tech utopia bullshit that we've been listening to for years and years and years. And like one of the reasons I'm now so cynical about Bitcoin and NFTs and all these things people talk about to be the same people who became millionaires and billionaires off of those tools and technologies are now telling us it's going to save the world in this new context. And I'm like, I don't fucking believe you. Maybe it will, but I don't think you know what you're talking about. Well, Boz more... or Sam Altman or like all these people in Silicon Valley. I, well, I'm more specifically worried about the fact that like Facebook's about to do this rebrand. Maybe it's called Meta.com with redirects to the Chan Zuckerberg initiative. Um, but what I'll tell I you, that's, that's some breaking news right here on this. <laughs> I didn't crack that. Twitter cracked that. Oh. But what I what I worry about is a company like, you know, I think of like a company like mm -hmm. IBM that totally changed its entire business model. But there were some like core cultural values about how they did did what they did that like carried over when they stopped becoming a home computer brand for Americans. And like, I think of what Facebook's culture is, and it makes me extremely nervous to imagine this group of people with this ethos in charge of more and more pieces of like the way in which we get information or interact with now the physical world. Gosh, I don't think like, again, like we all know a lot of people work at Facebook. They're good people, they're well-meaning, they're like, you know, 
they've worked in Democratic politics, Republican politics. I just think like now they're part of this massive thing that has created all these systems and this inertia and you get dug in and you get defensive. And it's like, I don't I don't know who will pull the breaker here or, you know, like make everybody. I hope this series of reports leads a lot of people to be like, oh, shit, I just learned a lot of stuff I didn't know. Like, yeah. that's how I felt when I the Snowden disclosures came out. My, my reaction to most of them, like, holy shit, I didn't know the U.S. government was doing this. I'm hoping that Facebook internally has a similar reaction. It's like, oh, God, I did not realize there was this much harm happening. Well, you know, or maybe you're not. Maybe if you work at Facebook right now and you just did find out about all this and you don't do anything differently, maybe you're not as good of a person as you thought you were. Well, there was this. There was this. Somebody to consider. There was this debate today about you know the earnings came out, their quarterly earnings, and it was uh, great <laughs> for Facebook. Right? I don't even know all the numbers. I don't give a shit. But anyway, great. And everyone's like, and some reporters are like, well, this proves that the company is not in crisis and stuff like that. I, I do think that I wonder if all of these stories will have the effect of both making current employees think twice about working there for the long haul. And I wonder if it will have an effect on Facebook's recruiting efforts in the future to try to like get the best engineers and the best employees to work for them. And I realize that that could be very naive because people like money and they want to work at a place where they make a lot of money. But I don't know. There's a lot of people who went to these companies because in their minds they thought they were helping change the world or doing something good or blah, 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 Or at blah, the very blah. least they didn't think that they were actively kind of Correct. rending society at its very core. Uh, look, I think there are people that will take money to work for tobacco companies. There are people who take money to, to uh, kind of, you know, yeah. sell sell OxyContin in West Virginia. But, you know, there's a tax. Uh, there's a tax you have. To, there's a tax these companies ultimately have to pay to get good people. Now, one reporter sort of tweeted that, you know, that Facebook's stock price going up after hours after their earnings report suggested that the company wasn't in crisis. Uh, I think that is sort of undercut by the fact that they reported Q3 earnings, which end September 30th. So none of the current period of, of turmoil yeah. was reflected in those earnings. They also made twenty eight point two billion last quarter. Like, yeah, it, it's a money printing machine. But I agree. I think the biggest problem is going to be recruiting because it's going to. It's hard. Like, it, people are now embarrassed to say they work there. Right. Um, Tommy, you mentioned this earlier, but the you know the Wall Street Journal ran a story about how employees uh, fought with Zuckerberg mm -hmm. and leadership over allegations that content rules aren't enforced for Breitbart and other right wing publishers for fear of public blowback, which sort of gets to the point where the, 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 the political, the concerns about bias at the top levels of Facebook, including Zuckerberg, are mm -hmm. pretty crazy. There was a um, there was a Diamond and Silk example, of course. A Facebook staffer said that there should be no punishment for a false post from Diamond and Silk because uh, they noted that the publisher, quote, has not hesitated going public about their concerns around alleged anti-conservative bias on Facebook. Imagine being scared of that. Uh, it's just, it's pathetic. It's completely it's pathetic. <laughs> and they're, 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 these are bad faith attacks. They work. They, they coordinate them. You know, you have Congress, uh, you know, putting out studies. Like John Kyle's office put out a study in 2018 about bias on Facebook. There's hearings. You have, like, lunatics like Louis Gohmert barking at your boss and there's some open hearings. So, yeah, of course, you get risk averse. It works. I'll also say one other thing, too, which is my experience of, I think, a lot of wealthier tech people, wealthier L.A. people, too, to be honest, they fucking hate the left. They hate the left. They hate the left just as much as they hate the right. These are not liberals. These are not Democrats. As you said, at best, they're centrists. Mm -hmm. Some of them are Republicans. And so they share the right wing antagonism uh, 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 towards the left uh, that they share the right. Let me say it like they, they share the right wing's antagonism towards the left wing of the Democratic Party. They agree with it. Uh, last thing worth mentioning before we move on is that several stories pointed out how Facebook didn't do enough to stop the January 6th insurrection that was mostly organized on its platform. The company rolled back measures it had taken before the election to stop the spread of content that promoted violence and misinformation. Um, Facebook's response, of course, is that they banned the Stop the Steal groups from the platform and that the responsibility for violence lies with Trump and others who incited it. What do you guys think of that response? <laughs> there, There's nothing Facebook likes doing more than shutting a barn door after the horses are gone, there I, do they have any horses left at Facebook? I mean, we are going to find out that we. I'm sh I am sure that the kind of protests that turned into a riot about uh, 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 about masks and vaccine in New York will have been fomented on Facebook. There was a story in the Washington Post today about a Montana town ri ripped apart because of uh, 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 pro insurrection uh, and anti COVID safety measures protests taking place there. We will those, of course, were organized on Facebook, like. It is a platform for misinformation. They allow it to get big enough and to turn into such a strong community. And they're like, now it's a problem. And let people find each other. Encourage, Encourage people to find each and other. Crowd building. Cra yeah. 
pretty important part of January group 6th. Group polarization. That's what they try to do. Cool. Um, speaking of January 6th, uh, two Stop the Steal organizers who were being interviewed by House Select Committee investigators spoke anonymously to journalist Hunter Walker for a Rolling Stone piece that published Sunday night where they revealed that rally organizers participated in dozens of planning meetings with members of Congress and the White House. Uh, this included Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and Representatives Lauren Boebert, Mo Brooks, Madison Cawthorn, Andy Biggs, Louis Gohmert, and Paul Gosar. Uh, Paul Gosar, who they said, quote, dangled the possibility of a blanket pardon in an unrelated ongoing investigation <laughs> to encourage them to plan the protests. Uh, one organizer actually told Walker, quote, our impression was that it was a done deal, that he'd spoken to the president about the b- blanket pardon in the Oval. Uh, the select committee is also looking into the January 6th money trail to determine whether any election law violations or financial crimes took place. And the entire House, all Democrats and nine Republicans, just voted to refer uh, Tommy's favorite podcast host, Steve Bannon, for prosecution after he defied a subpoena to testify. Uh, what would you think of that Rolling Stone story? It uh, you know set Twitter ablaze, as they say, on Sunday evening. Was it blazing? Oh, it was, oh Twitter was hot. <laughs> believe us if you didn't see it it was hopping too hot for tv uh the pardon piece was new to me yeah that yeah. was interesting i'd like to hear that under oathy a little under under oath action also, i want to know what the unrelated investigation yeah, is. that know. was an interesting twist to that we, we knew that members of congress were involved in the january 6 planning because one of like the main organizer this guy ali alexander said he formulated a strategy with gosar mo brooks and andy biggs on a live stream that has since been stricken from the record. Um, there was also a sort of a, a article in the Washington Post about this outside war room at the Willard Hotel that kind of folded into this. And that's where my friend, my mentor, Steve <laughs> Bannon, uh, Rudy Giuliani, Bernie Carrick and that crew was Couple mentors there. doing the kind of outside game where they're trying to pe- pressure Pence into overturning the election. The interesting thing to me in that story is we now know that the Trump campaign reimbursed Bernie Carrick $55,000 for renting those rooms. So these things were directly tied. And we also know that Trump was like pressuring Pence one minute alone in the Oval Office and then calling into the little Willard war room the next to, to get the outside game going. So it was directly coordinated with the White House. So I, there was this debate as to whether or not what this did, does constitute like coordinating or in, uh, certainly inciting the insurrection but coordinating and planning the insurrection and i think i think on the one hand i think that's actually not proven but also on the other hand i think what you take away from these stories is it doesn't really matter because what i see in this is like more examples of like it's stochastic fascism it's the equivalent of the al-qaeda inspire magazine telling people that they should launch random attacks mm-hmm. without ever explicitly saying in any of these things, commit an act of violence, break into the Capitol. Throughout Trump's words, and and, and, and we saw it actually in some of the Facebook stories and then in some of these stories, this idea of wild as a word to describe the protests, I don't know what that means other than frightening, scary, not simply speech, but no one ever explicitly comes out and says it. And I was really, what I was struck by in seeing those, many of those members of Congress, both both inciting those people to violence and then kind of, kind of, um, kind of have like a smug look on their face when they're kind of holed up in the Capitol is this was the wrong amount of violence for them. Like no violence or far more violence would have served their purposes. But unfortunately, uh, it was Hmm. just it was just a few people dead and not enough to overturn the election. That didn't Goldilocks it for you? Well, it's the uh, I'm going to this is going to be the most pretentious thing I say. Uh, Uh, Well, we'll be the judge of that. (laughs) So there's this uh, James Thurber quote. Oh, my God. (laughs) Which is that. uh, uh, I told you. You you quoted a philosopher earlier. I told you. Uh, This is worse. Something pump. Uh, it's an intuition I pump, Daniel Dennett. Yeah, I think it's an Aerosmith album it's, about a bulletin it's that board or something. Two, uh, two martinis is too many, but three martinis is not enough. And like a small insurrection is too much violence, but a grand insurrection that takes place at capitals across the country mm-hmm. that was to the level they would have loved is uh, is not enough. I just John, think, your thoughts? I, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I th- <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> You know what? Put it in the comments. <laughs> Put it in the <laughs> comments. Let John know. You Heteronormative like, bullying. I love James Thurber. Why are you guys making It's not about it? John James Thurber. <laughs> Gordon Wood. Sorry. Uh, that was doing Go. a Favreau impression. Go. I just think well, you alluded to the d- the debate that's going on here, which I think is important. I think we have to separate two different things here. Let's pretend that not a single person entered the Capitol, not a single rioter. What you would have had then was a series of organized rallies 
organized with the White House and members of Congress to pressure members of Congress to vote to overturn the election. Right. So even if you never had any violence or anyone breaking into the Capitol, that enough is a bunch of members of Congress and the President of the United States and his staff trying to overturn a free and fair election. It's bad enough. Yeah. <laughs> and like, But you're saying it's not illegal? I mean, is that, I, I don't know, is it treason? No, I, I'm it, just, I, what are we talking about? Oh, like, I'm just saying, like, whatever, it, it, it's... I mean, it, we are at the point now where it is something that it should be taken to the voters of this country to make sure that, that we never elect these the people or Donald Trump again, is what I'm saying. Now we have to find out, in all of that planning, was there also explicit planning about a violent insurrection, about people coming into the Capitol, causing violence, hurting you know, or hurting people, whatever happened, or sorry, all the things that we saw actually happen on January 6th. On that, we don't know yet, but that's part of what the investigation should uncover. I saw a lot of people saying, oh, all these members of Congress should be expelled. Like, like, yeah, of course they should. But it takes two-thirds majorities to expel members of Congress, so that's never going to happen. I just don't – the one thing I'm a little worried about is everyone getting all uh, Mueller investigation here. Like, let's not uh, set the standards of success for this investigation at, like, expelling every Republican we don't like for, come from Congress because it's not going to happen. I, I think success looks like – uh, transparency and understanding yes. and hopefully an associated political impact. Yes. You know, that's a lot to ask for these days. I do think, look, if you could prove that someone said, hey, if, if someone texted, like, let's go fuck up the Capitol and break in and maybe hurt some people or yeah. steal those election certificates, yeah, sure, that's a crime. Yeah, I'll also say, by sure. the way, like... And if, and if a member of Congress was involved with that and yeah. is proven to be involved in that, then, right, it's even fucking worse. And, and I would say, like, we don't, we haven't seen that evidence yet. It it's not as far fetched as you want it to be. I mean, there was that uh, uh, um, those protesters that were allowed to enter a state house, and they found the footage that mm -hmm. showed a fucking member of the assembly or the state senate opening open the door, door and yeah. letting them in. So the Oregon, Oregon, or yeah, Oregon or Washington. Yeah, I think it was Oregon. But the um, and we do know that like there has been rumors and sort of <laughs> questions about the coordination with from people like Gosar, from people like Bobber, from people like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Uh, with some of the insurrectionists, and we, we haven't gotten to the bottom of it yet, and we don't know the answer yet. No. You guys want to know the Bannon response to all this? Not yeah, really. I do. Oh, sure, yeah. So Bannon is going like full Special on. Special correspondent. Special Bannon correspondent, Tommy Vitor. Full on wild conspiracy. So on the show yesterday or today or whenever it was, he had a guy on from an outlet called Revolver News on his podcast. Mm -hmm. And this guy wrote an article that's so insanely long that I actually read it, but I will just briefly summarize it for you. But the gist... <laughs> Is that they had this these videos of this one guy like going up to people and being like, "Hey, let's go, let's get into the Capitol, let's break in." And what they are suggesting is that this guy was actually one of several FBI informants, oh, come on. and that this was a government job. They're called they called it a failed intelligence operation. And one of the guests on Bannon's show even suggested that the FBI planted the pipe bomb. So I, I know this is crazy, but Bannon's like this is what he's spinning, and he told all his listeners to say. You need to push this story to everyone you know. You need to share it on social media. Go to their website, blah, blah, blah. So, like, this is what's coming on Tucker. Like, that this was an FBI setup of Trump. But here's the other, There's also another thing to separate, which is the, the planning and what happened before the insurrection and then what happened during the insurrection. And here's something that we know for sure is that while it was happening, while there was a violent insurrection at the Capitol, while people were breaking and trying to find members of Congress to cause them harm, mm -hmm. Donald Trump saw it unfold and was like, Fuck yeah. He Great. Loved it. He loved, like, it. He loved, he loved it. it. And again, Let's keep, he didn't do anything to stop it. Mark Meadows didn't do anything to stop it. The White House staff didn't do anything to stop it. But like Republican members of Congress, some of them, now they pretend that didn't happen, but they were pleading with Donald Trump like Kevin McCarthy to stop it from happening. And they didn't stop it from happening. So like whatever, again, whatever the planning was beforehand during the insurrection, the president did not try to stop it. And I'll go, it is, he loved it. His only problem with it to this day is that it didn't work, which tells me for Donald Trump, the right amount of insurrection is either none or a fucking ton more. I do. I will think yes. about the martinis because you're right. Once you get to three martinis, it's not enough. Thank you. How many do you want? Like six? Well, once you get to three, you might as well have six. Yeah, exactly. You're going to feel bad either getting way. It. Now you're getting it. Well, I'm getting once it. Once you hit your late 30s, it. you sniff a martini. Well, you should have started. The, as, soon, as soon as you hit the martini, that for me, I was like, oh, yeah. Now I'm also like not, now, now we're talking about now we're talking about drinks. Can somebody <laughs> please, by, by the way, source this to me? Because I'm really afraid it's going to turn out that it's like, uh, actually, it was Albert Einstein from Brainy Quote who said two <laughs> martinis is too many. <laughs> um. All right, before before we leave this topic, I think Tommy, you wanted uh, you had something fun for us. Yeah, well, <laughs> well, you again, the listeners will be the judge of that. Um, so, one interesting, one important source 
for the recent details about the Trump coup attempt is Bob Woodward's most recent book. And that got me thinking about how every Bob Woodward book has three core elements. Mm -hmm. One, juicy insider details. Mm -hmm. Two, sort of an omniscient voice that makes it impossible to verify said details. Mm -hmm. Three, a histrionic title. You bet. The most recent of which was Peril. Um, Did so, he also do Fury, or was that Michael uh, Wolf? Uh, according Sorry. to my extensive research of Bob Woodward's uh, Wikipedia page summary, not the full thing, uh, he has written 21 books on U.S. politics or current events. Holy shit. So today... I, don't, I can't even get through 21 tweets. I'm going to ask you guys to play a little game. I'm going with all the president's melodrama. Sure. All the president's verbs. Okay. Something one of those. Okay. Whichever. You, you tell us the game first. Okay, cool. Which one I'm going to tell you three book titles. Two are real Woodward books. One is not. Okay. Are you oh, ready? Oh, okay. Let's do it. Love it. I saw Google. Get No, no, no. Get I was looking. I wasn't Googling. I didn't I know what the quiz was going to be. Screen, I was looking up Googling. the name. Of, I was looking up the name of the quiz I was show. Up, I was looking up the name. Is it? This is his quiz show. I was looking up the name because you're antagonizing a Jewish contestant. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was looking up the name of his Belushi book because a lot of people view the Belushi book as an example of him kind of having these sort of like unverifiable narratives. Anyway, go on. I'll Two true, you, one false. Is that what it is? Two true, one false. Okay. Uh, I'll give you a pass for that. Great. Uh, here we go. Ready? Mm-hmm. Shadow. Maestro. Undaunted. Uh, undaunted. Uh, oh, Maestro is definitely real. I don't know if it's Shadow. I, I think Shadow's fake. Undaunted is the title of a memoir by John Brennan. That's what I do. That. That's why. Yeah. Uh, the War Within, the yeah. choice in Trump time. In Trump in time. Trump time? The, I know the. I think that's the fake one. The War Within, the choice. Yeah. In Trump I've never time. I heard in Trump time. In Trump time. Yeah, that, that can't be. It's right. not even grammatical. In Trump time, a Journal of America's Plague Fear is a book by Peter Navarro. <laughs> okay. There you yeah, go. There you go. Ready? Mm -hmm. Yes. Bush at war. That's real. Worthy that's real. fights. Not sure. The Secret Man. Ooh. Worthy Fight sounds not... I don't think that's a good enough title. He's, he's good at titles. He's a marketing man first and foremost, that Bob Woodward. What was the set? What was it? What was the last two? Bush at War. That's right. That's Worthy real. Fights. The Secret Man. I think, I think Worthy Fights is fake. I'm going to go with... Worthy Fights, too. Worthy Fights by Leon Panetta, a memoir yeah. of leadership and war and peace. Uh, <laughs> generic for our man, Bob. <laughs> The Brethren, Oof. known and unknown, the That's final him. days. Oh, those are. Oh uh, man, the they all sound like no, those Brethren are all is, good. They sound like known and unknown is his book about the Rumsfeld years, and I think that I know the last one was the Woodward, so I think it's the first one. So, sir, which one do you think is Brethren? It? Yeah, I'll you do think that Brethren too. is fake? Yeah, same, same, same. Sorry, the Brethren oh. is his book about the Supreme Court. Known and unknown oh. is Donald Rumsfeld's memoir. Oh, oh it's I was his about Rumsfeld. <laughs> <memoir. laughs> uh, last one, fear, duty, rage, <laughs> duty. Duty. Duty's fake. Duty. Memoirs of a Secretary of War by Bob Gates. You see what I did here I, is I, 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 I made you, the case. Other, other people in the blob. As I was doing the game, <laughs> I was going to mock Woodward's title, and then I realized all political book titles are kind of douchey. So here we are. That was great. That was fun. Now stay tuned for an interview on Forward. <laughs> 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 with Andrew Yang when we come back. Perfect. All right. He is a former Democratic candidate for president and mayor of New York. He just announced he is leaving the Democratic Party to form a new third party called the Forward Party. Andrew Yang, thanks for being here. John, thanks for having me. I think the last time I saw you, there was a uh uh, in-person podcast in Boston, Mass. I think that yes, was... Yes, on stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. was great. Um, and you had a great conversation with Tommy during the primaries as well. So I want you to know that over the past few days, I have consumed an enormous amount of Yang content. The book, the interviews, the podcasts. And I went in extremely skeptical. And I came out extremely skeptical. But I was really reminded of why I like you so much, which is... I think you talk about issues like a human being. Uh, you make hard problems accessible to people, and you help people think about broader solutions uh, to structural problems in interesting ways. And two, I think you have a, a natural optimism and curiosity and joy in how you campaigned that was really exciting to a lot of people, especially people that weren't paying attention to politics before. That is what is, excites me about you as a figure. You talk about watching the insurrection unfold with horror. You say democracy is hanging by a thread across the country right now. Trump is leading an effort to put in place people and rules to try to overturn the next election. At the same time, studies show that Democrats and independents get their news from a wide variety of sources, some liberal, some mainstream, while Republicans have become concentrated in this bubble around Fox News and some of its satellites. 
I view this as an existential crisis. How does the forward party help stem the impact of this authoritarian drift, specifically in the Republican Party? Well, thank you for digging into Yang content. There's part of me is like, it's like I feel bad for you, you know. Uh, first, first, let, let me, me say, say that, that uh, I share people's concern about what is coming. Um, I saw, for example, the recent Bill Maher video saying, look, uh, we should take the demise of democracy in 24 as a real possibility. Uh, I think that is where we are, truly. And the question in my mind is, what do we do about it? Uh, and the answer that I've been suggesting to people is before our eyes in the great state of Alaska, where if you look at the Republican senators who voted to impeach Donald Trump, there aren't many of them, uh, but there was only one who was also up for re-election in 2022. Mm-hmm. Now, it turns out if you're a Republican senator and you decide to go against Trump, you're like, oh, maybe voters will forget about it in, you know, over the next several years. But that's not the case for Senator Murkowski. She's up for re-election essentially immediately. And the reason why she voted to impeach Trump, I'm sure, was because she thought it was the right thing to do. But I'm going to suggest it was also largely because Alaska has changed its process as of just last year, where instead of going through a partisan primary where she'd answer to only the 10 to 20 percent most extreme Republican voters in Mm -hmm. Alaska, uh, it goes straight to the general public. And so she can go to 50.1 percent of the voters and say, look, I did what I thought was right. I'm an independent voice. Uh, I've represented you for years to the best of my ability. And now she has a fighting chance. So if you're concerned about the potential disintegration of our democracy, which I believe we should be, Mm -hmm. I'm going to suggest that if you had a critical mass of, let's call them moderate Republican senators who are able to vote on principle and what they all thought was the right thing as opposed to what uh, their party is dictating, then that could be the difference. And so that's what we should be racing to accomplish as quickly as possible. We should be trying to liberate, let's call it six or eight or 10 senators to have freedom to vote on principle like Senator Murkowski does by virtue of the process change they just implemented in Alaska. So uh, you talk a lot about ranked choice voting. I think that's great. Uh, You talk about open primaries. I'm I'm a little bit more skeptical about the value of open primaries in part because uh, there are some form of open primaries right now in Arizona, Colorado, Kansas, Maine, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Rhode Island, West Virginia, Alabama, Michigan, Montana, Vermont, Arkansas, Minnesota, North Dakota, Virginia, Georgia, Mississippi, South Carolina, Wisconsin, Hawaii, uh, Missouri, Texas. You also have top two primaries in Washington and California. A lot of states have gone for open primaries, but it turns out that some of these underlying structural and cultural issues around polarization are not solved by open primaries. There's something deeper going on. And when you talk about making these kinds of changes, I'm all for them. But I worry it's a little bit like walking through a house that's on fire and saying, here's where we should have had smoke detectors. Here's where we needed a better egress. Here's where these stairs should have had better lighting. That's great. But we're in an emergency right now. And what I see is a authoritarian Republican Party on the rise and a Democratic Party that needs to be infused, not just with the current bevy of part of partisans, of septuagenarian senators, but the new and engage young people that you can help bring into that movement right now to save this country so that we have the opportunity to put in place some of these changes. Well, I wish, too, that we were talking about making these reforms uh, before the House was on fire. (laughs) (laughs) But one of the, the dynamics that you just pointed out, which I also completely agree with, is that polarization is as high as it's ever been, and it's rising, in large part because different Americans are getting their information from very different places, Mm -hmm. and in in large part because of the collapse of institutional trust in certain communities. So, uh, and I I talk about this in the book, which which you clearly um, have read through, but the trust and relationship in media varies widely between parties, Mm -hmm. where 69% of Democrats trust the media, only 15% of Republicans do. So the question is, how do you try to break up this polarization, us versus them dynamic in as fast a time period as you can. Uh, And if you're concerned about the rise of authoritarianism, uh, because let's say one major party has succumbed to bad leadership, um, one of the things you should be trying to do is make the system more multipolar as quickly as possible so that there are actually more institutional safeguards in place, because those safeguards don't exist Uh, as much in a two-party system. It's one reason why, for example, John Adams and our founding fathers would see our two-party system as uniquely fragile and vulnerable. So again, I wish I was running around trying to help 
immunize a system that didn't have uh, a disease <laughs> right. that was this advanced. Um, but I'm going to suggest that this is still uh, the best approach in conjunction with what you're describing. Like if someone says, look, Andrew, Team Dem, like let, let, let's go defeat Republicans. I say, have at it. Let's do it. Let's do um, it. Let's it, do it is different than have at it. Or, or have at it. Let's do it let, or have at it. Well, now as an independent, it's a bit uh, more have at it than, than, that's than let's the do it. That's the problem, though. That's but the I'm, problem. But I'm going to be endorsing candidates who are going to be running as Democrats, as Republicans, as independents. And I believe that the hinge group that our entire Democratic project rests on is independents and moderate Republicans. And the problem right now is that a lot of this group is subject to the leadership of the party, which is likely to be Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is try and create a dynamic where that group of people that's embodied by figures like Senator Lisa Murkowski have a fighting chance to be free of political incentives that are making it so that they cannot actually vote independently on principle. Well, one way to make them be free of those incentives is by shifting the incentives, by showing them that there's less, there's less value in the politics of Donald Trump. And the way you do that is by defeating Donald Trump's movement at the ballot box. I don't care what kind of changes you make. If being endorsed by Donald Trump is how you win primaries and win elections, it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter how many ballot measures you put out there. It doesn't matter how many open primaries you have. I mean, I come back to this problem, which is I am all for these long-term solutions. I'm all for doing them as quickly as humanly possible. Yep. But I don't think any of that will matter if in the next two years we have a Republican Congress and a potentially Donald Trump as a candidate who works with that Republican pro uh, Congress to overturn the election. We will never have ranked choice voting. They're installing people in Michigan that don't believe uh, that Democratic votes should really count at the end of the day. I mean, how do we, if you want to achieve some of these solutions, you should be getting behind Democrats to defeat as many Republicans as possible. And inside of the Democratic tent, becoming a leader who helps make these solutions part of the Democratic agenda. Because by the way, people like Elizabeth Warren, a bunch of different Democrats, they're all for ranked choice voting. I'm for ranked choice voting. Ranked choice voting, you just lost a primary with ranked choice voting. And it's I'm just, still a fan, yeah. And so still a go. fan, yep. and still a fan. Well, uh, again, I wanted to, to focus on Alaska uh, because it's a red state. Mm -hmm. And let's say that Andrew Yang, Democrat, showed up in Alaska and was like, hey, like, you know, let, let's change the process. We all know that would be a non-starter. But the people of Alaska independently adopted both open primaries and ranked choice voting uh, in an environment that will make all of the difference. So if you are able to do the same thing in, let's call it Utah, Missouri, like different places that would actually, again, unlock the, this critical mass of legislators, that could be the project. And if you try and undertake that project from a partisan uh, stance from day one, it, it never gets off the ground. I mean, if, if you look at what we have to do right now, the action has to be in red states as much as any place else, uh, particularly in a polarized environment like the one we're in. Mm -hmm. You know, like if you if you just chalk up to the fact that, look, at this point, like you know, there's the blue camp, there's the red camp, the tensions are just going to go up and up and up. Uh, like, how can we actually change that dynamic? And you cannot change that dynamic if you're just running around, in my opinion, to blue states and making a case for reforms in those environments. You have to take the reforms to red states and purple states, and you're much more likely to be able to actually accomplish that if you don't seem like you're an appendage to one party or another. So that's actually something you also talk about. You talk about what happens when people would find out you were running as a Democrat. And... Uh, that people kind of shut down, right? That, you know, you talk, basically, you know, people are interested in your ideas, but they've been kind of, uh, they've, whether it's through talk radio because they're truck drivers and they've been listening to talk radio all day or they've been listening to Fox News or Facebook, when they hear somebody's a Democrat, they're just not interested anymore. And yet, over the last couple of years, we've seen Medicaid expansion pass in Idaho and Utah. We've seen minimum wage increases passing in red states. We've seen weed legalization. Florida voted 60 to 40. In a year where they rejected two Democratic statewide candidates, they voted by 60-40 to uh, re-enfranchise people who had been uh, convicted of crimes. How do you think about the delta between progressive policies, and I think a lot of policies you would support, yes. uh, and progressive candidates? This is the point, and I'm so glad that you're hitting it. So all politics at this point is tribal. Mm -hmm. And if you go to uh, 
Republican, conservative truck driver or diner employee in a part of the country and you just say, hey, what do you think about drug prices? Too high? They'd be like, oh, heck yes. It's like, hey, do you want to make these changes and make sure that drug companies can't be raking the American people over the coals? They say, heck yes. Then if you say, hey, how do you feel about socialized medicine? They'll say, heck no. It's mm -hmm. just because they're coded for certain things. And so if you present the same proposal around, let's say, weed legalization or whatever it happens to be, it turns out that a majority of Americans are for it. Uh, a majority of Americans are for trying to address uh, the ravages of climate change. The problem right now is that we're being presented those things in these coded terms along tribalized lines. The correlation between my policy desires and my political self-identification is only 0.25. If you present the same policy in neutral language in a new way, you have a much better chance of having someone not shut down because there's a name, like you know, a letter next to your name where they're like mm -hmm. coded to say, oh, like, you know, I don't trust you. You look down on me, whatever the, the phenomenon is. Um, so that's the distinction we have to draw as quickly as possible is to try and get to goals and reduce the the tribal lines that right now are are false because it turns out that the majority of us agree on most things if you sit down with them individually and that's one of the great learnings I took away the problem now is that you have two tribes and so if you say hey I'm a member of this tribe you're going to shut down that conversation for let's call it you know 40 45% of the country but this is this is why I'm frustrated with you okay you're the guy to help break that down but instead of so there is a Fox. I hope to be the guy to break that down. There yes. is, let's say, let's hope. There's a Fox News. It is inuring tens of millions of people to policies they would otherwise like. There is a Democratic bubble that is far more porous, that involves CNN and the New York Times and Fox uh, and, and ABC and NBC and Pod Save America and Rachel Maddow. Uh, but there are these millions of people that right now are getting their news sources that tells them the Democratic brand is toxic. And you saw that as a real problem. And instead of saying, I want to figure out how to bring my people that are less engaged into this tent and how to change this democratic tent, I'm going to take my ball and go home. I got to start a new thing. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go to Americans where they are watching Fox News and say, hey, here are some ideas. And now you're not going to be immediately defensive and negative about them because I am no longer uh, the enemy, mm -hmm. essentially. Um, and that's the way we can open it up. That's the way also we can send a message to people that it isn't just a win-lose, zero-sum dynamic, us versus them. And that if you actually try and get someone to examine the substance of an idea, let's call it universal basic income, mm -hmm. then you can open them up to it. But it's much more uh, achievable if you're not trying to play, again, this like blue team, red team uh, dynamic in the same way. But – you know, you keep coming back to this tribal blue team, red team, but I think you also recognize, because I think you're, you know, you've seen the numbers and I think you're intellectually honest about this. You recognize that these teams are not equally divided or equally tribal. There is far more intellectual curiosity and honesty in the kind of structures of the Democratic Party. It's far more fact based. It is far more ecumenical in the way it gets its information than this cordoned off 40 percent of the country inside of the Republican bubble. Right. Oh, I'm not someone, and this is something that I, I feel bad about, I'm not someone who sees the issues as symmetrical. Right. <laughs> Let's put it that way. They're very asymmetrical issues. And when I talk about the vulnerability of one party uh, succumbing to authoritarianism and then there being no safeguards, you know, I'm clearly referring to, to one side. Um, so I see these issues as not being equivalent 100%. One question that came up a lot when I asked people what to ask you yeah, well, was, uh, Andrew Yang is a math guy. Doesn't he know the math of electoral systems versus parliamentary systems? Doesn't he understand the math that you can't, that you need to make changes to make a third party possible, and that until you make those changes, a third party is ultimately just going to take away votes from one of the two parties that will win in some kind of a first past the post system? What's your reaction to that? Uh, I say that what we need to do is first shift to a process that will allow different points of view to emerge. Right mm -hmm. now, 62% of Americans do want there to be some more dynamism in our process. If you look at any other industry, it continues to evolve and advance, but our politics does not. Uh, so if there's someone listening to this who's concerned about the spoiler effect, let's adopt ranked choice voting as quickly and broadly as we can. It would allow people to actually vote their preferences. It would enable, in many cases, more consensus building, coalition 
uh, building candidates who I'm going to suggest are more likely to be women candidates who right now, uh, in my view, get short shrift in the current plurality voting system. So if you're concerned about this dynamic, let's change it. Like, why, uh, why are we insisting on an archaic process that is distorting our results? If the Republican Party had ranked choice voting in 2016, Trump probably does not win. Well, why not have it? Why not be an advocate for ranked choice voting? as a leader of the Democratic Party. You're, you were because until two again, weeks ago a leader of the Democratic Party. Because if I'm an advocate for ranked choice voting as a leader of the Democratic Party, uh, then there's 40 to 50% of the country that will just say, oh, ranked choice voting is a Democratic thing and it's a dud. Again, we have to get this done in red states to have any meaningful effect. And Alaska, I'm heartened to say, you know, they it was homegrown. If you actually look at the support for some of these reforms, it's actually quite high among Republicans because Republicans have a general anti-institutionalist bent. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so if you say, look, stick it to the man, like, uh, you know, have rank choice voting and open primaries so that different parties can emerge, they're like, yeah. A- and I want to be the champion of that. I think that this is one of the anti antidotes to a dynamic that otherwise threatens to destroy us. Like I take the threat as seriously as anybody else. I just think that there is another approach that we can undertake simultaneously that will give us a better chance at avoiding utter disaster in the next several years. And so as like a you talk talk a little bit about what makes it a party versus just kind of a political organization, because my understanding based on what you've said about this is at first, certainly, you're going to be just endorsing Democrats and Republicans. It's almost like a kind of, um, you know, like when like when the like a um, like the, you know, the League of Conservation Voters <laughs> endorses somebody like are you going to for the most part at first, you're going to be Endorse. getting behind Democrats and Republicans. Yes. Um, and, and again, I do want to stress to people who are listening to this. I'm assuming you're a Democrat <laughs> 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 that a lot of the action has to be trying to get reasonable Republicans and independents elected. And so if Andrew Yang and the Ford Party can help make that happen, that could be the difference, which, by the way, you could not do as a Democrat, because if you're a Democrat and you endorse a Republican candidate, then they just run the other direction. But if you're the Ford Party and people see you as an independent actor and there are some Republicans uh, that want to work with us, um, then that could be the difference. I can't wait to get into some of these red states uh, and activate voters for candidates that will help preserve democracy. But we're going to be endorsing Republicans, independents, and Democrats. We're talking to multiple candidates. Uh, I'm really excited about some of the candidates that we're going to to get behind. Um, I I do want to emphasize, too, that the the Forward Party is uh, an inclusive, popular movement where you can be a registered Democrat and before these reforms, you can be a registered Republican and before these reforms. I'm getting incoming support from people of every political background, which makes me feel like we're doing the right thing and we're on the right track. Look, I am glad you're out there advocating for these changes. What I... (laughs) My worry, my concern. I, and by the way, like I, I, I knew going into this that I was going to sound like basically like Nancy Pelosi's like chief defender. Like I am sitting here as a defender of the Democratic Party, not because I give a fuck about the Democratic Party. I want to make sure we have the opportunity to make some real positive changes for people and stave off authoritarianism in the next couple of years. And my worry is the second that what you're doing right now goes from an effort to make some changes that are really positive for our democracy to the potential of hurting our ability to make sure Democrats keep the House and the Senate and win the presidency in 2024. I I get it. Uh, I share the same concerns. Uh, I'm going to do everything I can to be productive. Uh, And that there are are people, you know, it's like, I I get it. People have been burnt in various ways. Uh, I'm focused on what we can do in different environments to to move things in a better direction. And and one thing I do want to suggest to folks, too, and, you know, and, and this is part of what I'm about, 75 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. Um, are, are there people among that 75 million who hold very, very uh, terrible, objectionable, racist beliefs? Yes. Uh, is that true of 75 million Americans? I do not believe it is. Uh, you know, I have family members who voted for Trump. There are a lot of people that are just responding to the the uh, tribal values based appeal. Uh, you know, that that's like just pulling at certain notes and strings. So what we have to do is try and give some of those 75 million people like a place to channel their energies differently. There are a lot of Americans who are really pissed off and upset about how things are going, including on the left, I know. Yeah. <laughs> and so you look up and like the anger is getting expressed in this very dark uh, zero sum way because of the current dynamic. Like, uh, like we have to try and give some of the 75 million like a place to go. And it's not going to be Team D. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, it's like that's uh, well, that's it, not true. Right. There are there are people who switch from Donald Trump to Joe Biden. Right. 
Oh yeah, they, I'm sure they, they they voted, and I, I I don't want to oversimplify that and say that that does not happen. Um, but the the zero sum game, we can all sense that the polarization is getting worse, not better, um, and all of our incentives are driving us in that direction. You know, from the political incentives to the media incentives to the, of course the social media incentives. I mean, like you know, the the more up in arms you are, uh, you know, the the more power it it, uh, it, generates. it generates. So you wrote the book in 2020. When I was reading the list of the kind of pillars of, maybe you should run through them. Can you run through a little bit the list of the kind of pillars of the forward party, the policy pillars you outline in the book? No, yeah, sure. Um, so the the first is open primaries and ranked choice voting, which I see as the structural reform that can help both break us free uh, of this um, polarization, but also get real goals across the finish line. And there was a Republican senator who said to me the other day something that we really should take very, very seriously. Um, she said, we get rewarded more for keeping an issue around than resolving it, uh, which is like if we reach across the aisle and compromise, we're probably going to get a beating and some of us are going to lose our jobs. Um, whereas if we just keep the issue around, then we can raise money around it. We can get votes around it. Uh, and so our political incentives are just to not do it. <laughs> you know? and, and the thing I thought of when she said this to me was Marco Rubio on immigration reform uh, a few years ago where he's like, let's do this bipartisan thing. And then he got shouted down. And then all of a sudden it's like, let's not do that. I was just kidding. So uh, so that that's something that we need to try and change. And I think open primaries and ranked choice voting is the way. Because again, right now, 83% of our legislators answer to the 10 to 20% most extreme voters in their district and not the general public. And if you change that, that could be the game changer. And so, and on reforming democracy, I mean, right now, there's this mansion Klobuchar bill that was about, you know, stopping, you know, certain aspects of the way in which Trump is trying to overturn the election, expanding voting, getting rid of partisan gerrymandering, something that actually would do a lot about this polarization, right? Because gerrymandering yes. leads to these kind of more extreme districts uh, and even included voter ID, which is a compromise to kind of get Republicans on board and they couldn't, right? Right now, the coalition in the in the, in the the Congress in favor of uh, uh, voting rights and, 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 and democracy reform runs from Joe Manchin to AOC, but includes zero Republicans. I do believe that at least some of the Republican senators would have an interest in it, uh, but I, you, you're not surprised to know that I, I'm very much for those yeah, yeah. reforms and um, and those protections, and, and they could be the difference. And I am also for getting rid of the filibuster, which um, uh, you know is something they made up a number of years ago. <laughs> I mean, I, I, honestly, like I, I was around a senator who was talking about the filibuster. Um, and I just had this sinking feeling. I was like, uh, you know, wh- where she was making the case that, you know, it's an important part of institutional integrity. And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> um, so that was uh, cinema, right? That was cinema. Because you've talked about this. You've talked about this. You were she was sort of defending it in private near you. Right. Yes. Cool. Very cool. And and I, it gave me that sinking feeling. It did. Mm-hmm. So, you know, did um, you scream or anything? I'd have shout. I would have been able to unable to contain myself. If I'm in a private room with Kirsten Cinema and she's defending the filibuster, I will just go. Ma! Um, <laughs> I, I will share with you that uh, someone else had a reaction such that I did not need to. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so it was it was expressed. It was mm-hmm. it was voiced. Um, and then so the next pillar, right, is uh, human centered capitalism. Yes, we have the wrong measurements. Uh, we're 28th in the world in ter- th- terms of infant mortality, access to clean drinking water, life expectancy, the basics, mm-hmm. really. Uh, and the, the fact that we're disintegrating on that level, I think, is, is driving a lot of the, the frustration. Our leaders aren't really held accountable for our way of life. They're being held accountable by scoring political points uh, and you know, getting on cable news and, and having a good hit. I mean, uh, the, the stuff's a disaster. Like, the, the only thing that should matter is just how we and our families are doing. Yeah, well, look, on human center capitalism and UBI, which we already discussed, like, right now, there is this effort to do expand health care, make sure Medicare covers things like dentistry, family and medical leave. I think that's a big part of human center capitalism, letting people take time off. Like, you're describing the Democratic agenda to a large extent. Again, I'm, I'm sitting here like I'm... Uh, like Chuck like Schumer, Mr. but, 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 yeah, I, but Mr. I want to push you on this. I want to push you on this because I think sometimes it's it's fun to say, you know, we don't need the, the duopoly is the problem. But then when you outline some of these these ideas, I think, well, they fit very well within the Democratic mainstream right now. I am a fan of just about everything I've seen in the reconciliation package. Uh, and I want very, very big changes to be possible in the United States of America. And I believe that this is a path to help get us there. Um, but you've read my book, so you know I'm for universal health care, universal basic income, like improving these measurements that, that we're talking about right now. Uh, you know, the vision and goals are, are the same. Uh, I have a different 
sense of how to get there. Um, and part part of the insight I gained really is that again, we're not really having policy disagreements. It turns out like we're we're just being tribalized and and having these uh, these contests, uh, you know, and and these are contests that eventually are going to to lead us nowhere, lead lead us to a very nasty direction. Yeah, but we're, we are, but like we are having a policy debate. It just happens to have to take place inside the Republican Party because right now we have one fact based governing institution, which is very flawed and run by a bunch of, of octogenarians who do not know how the internet works. And we have a political party, a Republican party, a campaigning institution that has no interest in governing once it wins. But we do have, for, we're in the middle of a ferocious policy debate. Joe Manchin is trying to strip out climate change protections. Democrat. Kirst, Democrat, absolutely. Kirsten Cinema uh, uh, doesn't want to uh, lower and, and, and ta- and cut this, taxes this, for a corporate, this wants to cut tax for corporations. Yeah, in, yeah. In, in many ways. So you have the Democratic Party that's very, very big tent um, because it's a necessity. Um, but but part of this is that you have zero Republican senators willing to play ball in any of these things. And mm-hmm. one approach to be like, hey, you know, that that party, uh, terrible, no interest in governing. And I understand those criticisms because, you know, they literally didn't even have a platform during their, their last convention. I mean, right. that's, that's kind of bizarre. <laughs> and so the question is, which of these problems do you want to try and, and, and solve for? And if you were to have, let's say, just like a, a few Republican senators willing to play ball on certain issues, then... Maybe Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema's uh, point of view isn't quite a, a, as elevated. Completely and you, and you agree. Can, and, and so you can look at that and say, like, what approach are we going to take? And and my my approach is going to be, look, the Republican Party should not be this monolith the way it is. Like, we need to try and make it so that there are some subset of reasonable people and people listening mm-hmm. to this could think that subset's very, very low and I get it. <laughs> but but if you have even that very, very low subset stand up and say, you know what, like I, I'm on board with some democracy protections and reform. I'm on board with, with, with this or that. Like that's actually in, in many ways the key variable, the missing piece right now. That, I think that's totally right. And like, you know, you talked about the filibuster. One thing that's very frustrating is if Cinema and Manchin just said we're open to get rid of the filibuster, suddenly a bunch of Republicans might play ball because something would pass anyway. And so might as well try to make it better. You know, you quote uh, our boy Ezra Klein extensively in the book I, like, to the point where I hope you maybe like sent him a royalty him check something. or something. <laughs> royalty check. Oh, I said, oh, I I sent him. I sent him a thank you. A thank I you. sent them like uh, you know the but one manuscript. Of the, but one of the takeaways from that book is actually sometimes bipartisanship has been at its best in this country's history when there was actually one majority party and a minority Be- because they knew something was going to pass because they, they knew something ball, was yeah. going to go past. Which brings me back to thinking, wow, if you really want to see some bipartisanship, either get rid of the filibuster so they know we can pass things with fifty votes, or help build this democratic majority. What, what I, I what, what I, I come down to at the end of this when I lead read this list of pillars is, my God, I think Joe Biden is the perfect candidate for the forward party. I mean, this is a guy whose whole entire life is built around grace. He almost lost the primary because he was being too nice about Republicans. All he does is talk about how they're friends. He wished they would have an epiphany. His career is built on loss and trying to overcome that by reaching out to people. I mean, don't. I guess what I come down to over and over again is polarization is more fun to talk about than, you know, saying that that being on the outside, saying uh, we need to take on these two parties and leading a movement. That's more fun than the kind of the work of being inside of a movement. And I think and I'm getting to the but this is the big but. Someone who runs for and, I, and I'm going to ask this because I'm going to I'm being honest. This is seriously my, my concern here. Yep. Someone who runs for president as a long shot, then turns around and runs for mayor of New York, then drops out of the Democratic Party to start a p- political party. What I worry about is that as someone that is more interested in leading a failed movement than being a mere participant in a successful movement. What is your reaction to that? When I was running for president, one of the most popular questions I would get from journalists was, are you serious? And I was a very marginal candidate when I was getting this question. Mm-hmm. So if you say uh, no, then clearly you're ridiculous and you know, like that's bad. Um, if you say yes, then you seem like you're not lucid and that's not bad. Uh, that's not good. Um, so, uh, so I would say things like there are multiple versions of victory, uh, which was accurate in my mind. If you say, like, hey, how did Andrew Yang's presidential campaign go? Uh, trust me when I say that I was not sitting at home brokenhearted that I was not president of the United States. You know, that, that wasn't like, <laughs> like, like I, I felt. Well, you were up late writing. Uh, I felt I was up late writing. It's true. But I, I felt very because I was trying to unpack what had just happened to me because I had done zero reflection on the trail uh, because I was too busy trying to, you know, like stay alive. Um, 
Uh, and so my goal was to try and advance our understanding of what was happening to us economically, uh, advance universal basic income, which now two thirds of Americans are mm-hmm. for in some some version. And I found that to be very, very successful. Um, I, I ran for mayor of New York City simply because I wanted to help. Um, and you and you understand the chronology is that I wrote this book uh, in 2020 prior to <laughs> to deciding to run. Uh, I probably would have done something differently if I knew I was going to run. Um, uh, and now my goal is to try and strengthen and modernize and upgrade the mechanics of our democracy as quickly as possible uh, in a way that will create better incentives for a critical mass of legislators to represent the public interest and not the partisan interest. Now, when when you say that it's like more fun, I mean, trust me when I say that, you know, like, I'm not sure that doing something uh, in this direction is what someone would consider, you know, like the, the most uh, carefree, (laughs) (laughs) like, you know, like thing that one could do with one's time. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm driven by a mission to help my country as best I can. Um, I understand if some people may have concerns about my approach. Um, what I'd ask of them is to, uh, extend me a little bit of the benefit of the doubt and maybe some grace and tolerance and say, okay, like listening to Yang, he doesn't seem malignant. (laughs) Listen, this is a great slogan too. Not malignant. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, like that, that I, I have a point of view that I think is based upon my coming to grips with this tough reality. When I was researching my book and reading Ezra and, uh, you know, Lawrence Lessig and uh, Catherine Gale and, and other people. And then I was th- synthesizing and I had to come to, to grips with, do I think this is working? Do I think this is going to work? What would make it work? And I felt like I owed myself like an honest answer. And when I was writing this book, I had no idea what I was going to find necessarily. Like it, it wasn't like I didn't go into this book thinking like, you know what we're going to need? We're gonna need this. <laughs> but like after I, I went through it and I said, wait a minute, we're being set up to turn on each other, to fail, to become more and more angry and frustrated and despondent. We're heading towards political violence. Like what's a genuine solution or approach that could work? And I believe that shifting to open primaries and ranked choice voting in a critical mass of red, purple, and, and blue states um, is a solution. And then the question is, okay, how can you advance that in the time we have uh, in states that aren't in one camp or another? And the forward party is my honest, best approach to trying to solve the problem that we can see is growing more serious by the day. Well, uh, I will say I genuinely respect the way you approach these problems. I actually support a lot of the goals you have here. And my hope, and um, I will beseech you, that ultimately you recognize uh, that there is value in being part of the coalition that has the best chance of achieving these things together rather than leading the one that I think is a far longer shot. But I, but I genuinely do appreciate the goals you're trying to achieve. I just hope it does not come at the expense of the effort to defeat authoritarianism, to defeat this right-wing movement uh, by electing Democrats across the country. Well, thank you, John. And uh, I share the goal of making sure our democracy stands the test of time. And one, the, the goal I have is trying to make our system more genuinely resistant to authoritarianism. And this didn't come up in our interview. And I know some people are going to say, like, well, this is too much too soon. But if you look around the world, UK, five political parties, Germany, seven political parties, Sweden, eight political parties, Netherlands, 18 political parties. And that type of system is much more resistant to authoritarianism because if you have one party succumb to terrible leadership, then you have six other parties, whatever it is. It's also a parliamentary system. It is a parliamentary system, but we can accomplish some of the same goals just by having open primaries and ranked choice voting that, again, just improve the incentives of even the same leader. Like right now, our incentives are to to reward unreasonableness. And then we uh, look up aghast when people are unreasonable. (laughs) (laughs) Like if you change the incentives so that it rewards people for trying to do the right thing as opposed to punishing them, then more people will do the right thing. And we need people to do the right thing from uh, from right now, I'm going to say both camps or both sides. But we need to we need people to do the right thing uh, in part because they they don't have this like uh, this stance where this other side is my mortal enemy and I will take even very, very flawed leadership as superior to the other guys or gals. Uh, Like that's actually a recipe for authoritarianism over time. And I would love to prevent that. Andrew Yang, thanks for being here. The book is Forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to see you too. Thanks to Andrew Yang for joining us today. Thanks for Tommy for- He got his ass, love it. Letting us play that game called- 
Deep, uh, deep something? Can all we do a deep throat thing? Deep verbs. Co- deep. All the president's melodrama. So just, just tweet at us. Just no, or don't. Oh, no. For, John, you, for good titles. John, you're hosting a whole series about getting offline. How's that going? Uh, it's it's not. No, that's not Tommy. That's not what the series is about. The series, uh, is, the series is about, about Tommy. Gia, how to live online better than we already but, are, knowing that we Gia all can't. But Gia did it by un- getting offline. But then did you see, did you hear her? She said she got stuck back on. She's now a Twitter she, looker. She reads 150 she, books a year. She goes online and she sort of looks at the tweets. 150 books a year. I read her on saying that on Twitter once. That's so many books. Is there music? There should be music now. There should be music. Hope- Fear. Duty. Oh, it's duty. I hope the music is Island Boys. Dude, are you still laughing at duty? I'm laughing at duty. Duty, duty that's very... Wow. Bob Woodward. Is this funny? Is this something? Is this something? <laughs> Bob. TBD, John. It's coming out on Tuesday. That's all I know about this. Bye, guys. Bye. Uh, if you haven't already, check out the first episode of my series, Offline, where I chat with New Yorker staff writer Gia Tolentino about how the internet has turned life into an endless performance, why that makes politics hard and virtue signaling easy, and what being online during the pandemic has done to our collective psyche. Fantastic so, initial episode, John. Great. Act. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, uh, John. I was joking that um, by episode 85, what if the show just reverses on John and he goes down like the dark rabbit hole and becomes like a super crazy online person? Like be, somebody oh. who starts listening to Steve Bennett's podcast as a kind of as a lark and then realizes you can't listen to a podcast ironically. <laughs> Turned around hard on you, Tommy. I got some see inf- that? You see uh, that? You never know which way the wind's going to blow. Uh, yeah, wow. I feel that's wonderful. <laughs> Love it is Q. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to say I'll be Q in a couple episodes. Uh, new episodes drop every Sunday right here in the Pod Save America feed. And in other exciting pod news, what a day is celebrating its two-year anniversary all week long. Two wow. years for what a day. That's amazing. How about that? Wow. Congratulations to hosts Gideon Resnick, Priyanka Arabindi, Travel Anderson, Josie Duffy Rice, and the entire team at What A Day for reaching this incredible milestone. New episodes of What A Day drop every weekday at 5 a.m. Eastern. Things a hit. It's a hit. You should listen wherever you get your podcast. It's like secession for podcasts. Sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Man, you guys aren't very giving today. <laughs> I need more of a, a yes want, and out of you. All right. Well, just we're trying to get out of the promos. I have to say, Tommy, you keep pronouncing it secession and it's succession. Secession is like what happens in the union it, when, when like the South wants to secede. It's about succeeding oh, the Elder Roy. I'm sorry. It's about, and then it's about. I, I thought I would correct mo- you here on the podcast. I, I'm gonna, lots uh, of people. Uh, yeah, 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 no, I'm going to take your recommendation. <laughs> I'm going to just and, quietly tell you. I'm going to put it in my draw. Mm. Nice. Which is a well, thing that's where something you put that things. I say. Because of an accent that I can't quite pinpoint. So, yeah, you're right. You got him. You got him. <laughs>